So first thing I want to talk about today are group projects. So as of right now, there are, looking on Canvas, 33 people that are not in groups. And everybody needs to be in a group, hopefully, by the end of today. So if I look at section 201, I see this group has five, five, seven, seven, group of three, group of six, group of five. Who is not in a group that needs a group right now? So I see two people, three people. Three people need groups. That's it in this section. One, two, three. Okay. So again, looking at section 201, since we have a group of three and you need to have at least five. It's our group, we're a group of four, so I guess four person can number something. Is the group of is the fourth person on this list? I don't think he signed in. Are you group project twelve? Yes. So he's not one of these three people? Do you know his name? S? Yes. This one? Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's definitely in your group? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so he's in group project 12. So let's put Adam. So plus group project 12. Okay, so he's in your group. So how about your name? Sorry. Last name? Abby Harris. So why don't we put Abby in Group Project 12 as well? <clears throat> so you're going to be in here with these other, who's, uh, what's your name? Dylan. Abby meet Dylan. Dylan meet Abby. Who else needed a group? What's your name? You're going to be in Group 12 as well? So, sorry, 13? Make sure 13 has six people so you could do that. So this one, is that you? Asa Hacker? Oh, uh, no. No. Last name, Cam. Oh, Cam. Sorry. Hack Cam. So you're going to be in group 13. Okay. And then who's the last person? Bruno. And are you in, you're not in a group? No. Okay. So why don't we put you in group 12 as well? Because they only had five people. Unless uh, group eight or nine want somebody. Okay. All right. So, sorry. Last name again, Bruno. Okay. Sorry, my mouse is having trouble. Oh. With an N. I'm sorry. M. Oh. So we'll put you in, like I said, I'll also put you in group 12. So Bruno, you guys connect. Anybody else need a group? You have to be in a group. It's 40% of your grade. All right. <clears throat> so good. We got the groups resolved. Now, for the groups in section two. Did anybody sign up for stock track yet? Because I'd like to put your stock track names in here if you know them so you can start to figure out who else you're competing against. So you guys have a stock track name? Yeah. Which team were you? Group what? So group 11, edit. What's your stock track name? Team Terp. Team Terp? Okay. So I'll leave the section in front of that because that's who you are competing with, but Team Terp. We have another stock track? Yeah. Uh, which right here or with stock track? You're gonna have to call them and ask them to do it. I don't have the ability to change the name. So you don't want to be Team Dan anymore, is it? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately they kind of leave you with that name, but you can ask them if they can change it. But they have to do it on their side. <clears throat> That's okay. You're Team Dan. What else do we have? Any other stock track names? 
All right, so again, if you haven't signed up for Stock Track, now that the groups are set, make sure one of your group members signs up for Stock Track. If you have, like I said, you're welcome to start trading. All right, <clears throat> so today what we're going to do is we're going to finish up Lecture Note 1, and if we have time at the end, get into Lecture Note 2. But I will let you know that Wednesday, your next homework assignment, since, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll ask the feedback here in a second, but there were some challenges with, uh, as we're just learning how to use Bloomberg with homework one, that I thought we'd make homework two start out as an in-class assignment on Wednesday. So in class, you'll start your Bloomberg lab assignment, which will be homework two. You finish it in class, you're done. If not, you have until Monday to finish homework two, which will be an in-class assignment starting on Wednesday. Okay. So because there's only 30-odd terminals in this room and there's over 40 people registered, some of you on Wednesday may need to go down to the first floor lab to do it during class. Okay. So again, we'll talk about that all at the end of class. All right. So picking up where we left off. Oh, <clears throat> questions about the homework assignment. Anybody have trouble with the last Bloomberg assignment? So, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, I am learning some of the functionality along with you as we're trying to use more of the functionality this semester than we did even last semester. <clears throat> and one of the things that popped up is that some of the custom fields do not have historical data attached to them in Bloomberg. So I guess they're just calculated in real time. So in screen number one, you could do historical data, but in screen number two, you could not. And I think the reason is that they're not tracking WAC day by day. So that was the problem, is that if you did it on the fifth and you tried to backdate it to the fourth, it couldn't calculate a spread because it couldn't do the fourth's WAC. So therefore, you had to do it on that day. So when you submit your assignment, um, you might have slightly different data because we are, are literally right now in the earning season. And every day, companies are reporting their earnings, and Bloomberg is updating them in real time. So over the weekend, as a couple more companies' data was updated, you might get one or two numbers different than what I did on Thursday. That'll be okay for this assignment, but that would be the problem or the challenge. All right. Um, matter of fact, we learned another challenge when I was on the phone with the help desk last week, which is <clears throat> custom fields do not work in the FA section of Bloomberg, which I find to be a real problem, but nonetheless, it's not something somebody would actually ask them to do historically. So you might say, what does that mean? It's probably related to this. So the FA section of Bloomberg is, let's take IBM as an example. If I go to FA, <clears throat> matter of fact, I've been asking Stas about this right now in terms of the Bloomberg spreadsheet. Let's get an email there from them. But if I go to the FA section, <clears throat> like these are the historical data points for a company. You can't do custom fields on this. All right, so it doesn't make sense to me because you can do it in the equity screening tool, but you can't do it on historical data. So just limitations that we're going to stumble across as we start to heavily use Bloomberg this semester. So again, I was asking them if they can actually find a way to do that. So that's probably the response, but since I'm recording this, we're not going to spend time in an email war. All right, so let's talk about lecture one. Picking up where we left off, on slide six. So what I really want to talk about today is kind of core to what we're going to be doing this semester. So we're going to be getting into the weeds over the next few classes, but I kind of want you to know why we're getting into the weeds and also to start training you how to think. So one of the things that you kind of fall into if you're a finance major is you just kind of plug and play. Because just give me a formula, give me numbers, let me plug them in. But what I really want you to start doing this semester is to not just know the formulas, but know what they're telling you and to understand what they mean and how to apply them. So I want you to understand just the theory as much as the formulas. And so this is sort of a good <laughs> theory overview to some of the core things we're going to be talking about. So talking about cash flow valuation. <clears throat> so I want to start with this slide. So the idea is we have a company and I'm going to use this to define a few terms, that makes $100 million a year of something called NOPAT or NOPLAT. 
right? McKinsey calls it NOPLAT, N-O-P-L-A-T. The rest of the world calls it NOPAT, N-O-P-A-T. Virtually the same thing. Basically, it's the operating profit after tax. It assumes that we have an, an all-equity firm. All right, so it takes out the impact of capital structure, and it says if you have an all-equity firm, what profit would you make, and then what taxes would you pay on those profits to your owners? Because you're going to get, as the owner, the after-tax profit. So that's called NOPAT, $100 million. It's your EBIT times 1 minus the effective tax rate. Right? Now, <clears throat> two other ratios that are going to be core to the semester, something called the reinvestment rate or the investment rate, we'll use those terms interchangeably, and the payout rate. So of this $100 million in profits, this company is taking $50 million of profits and it's reinvesting to sustain and grow its business. It's taking the other 50 and it's paying it out as a dividend or share buyback. All right? And so again, the 50 it's reinvesting, investment, investment rate, reinvestment rate. 50 is paying out, payout rate. That's what's being returned to investors. These two ratios have to add up to 100% of your profits. Therefore, 1 minus the investment rate equals the payout rate. 1 minus the payout rate equals the investment rate. Okay, the two together, 100% of your total profits. All right. Now, continuing on with this hypothetical company. I wanted to find growth, little g, also known as the sustainable growth rate that we're going to be using this semester, and the concept of free cash flow. So let's start out with growth. <clears throat> so this company, which is reinvesting $50 million of its profits, has a 10% ROIC. For simplicity, we're just going to say 10% in the past. It'll stay at 10% in the future. Okay. So if they reinvest $50 million at 10%, they'll have $5 million of new profits. If they had $100 million worth of profits last year and the ROIC doesn't change, the core business will make $100 million this year. <clears throat> the $50 million at 10% will make $5 million of new profits. So I have $105 million worth of profits next year, 5% growth rate. Okay. Now, I can shortcut this into what's called the sustainable growth rate, G, by saying G is the investment rate times the ROIC. So I have a 50% reinvestment rate. I have a 10% ROIC on that investment. 10% of 50% says that my sustainable growth rate is 5%. So the sustainable growth rate is the rate at which a company can theoretically grow with internal resources. Growing faster than that will require either inorganic growth, think an acquisition, or it will require additional capital. Okay, So the G is not the rate for this purpose that I am growing at. It is the theoretical growth rate of the business. Okay, So it's what I could grow at. So <clears throat> let me just give you a quick example of this. So I'm, I'm working with a company, a little spreadsheet here, and they are working on their strategic plan. And they come up with a vision 2020. Right? So I do a lot of, outside of this class, real strategic planning work with companies. And I'm a decent communicator, so they'll hire me to basically not only help them with their plan, but to kind of communicate it internally to their firm. And I was going to communicate the financial targets of their plan and kind of explain what they meant. So I was like, okay, it's kind of fun, exciting project. Tell me about Vision 2020, which we'd help them create, that they got signed off from the board. So the CEO says, okay, we're going to have these targets. Target number one, we are going to grow, and Vision 2020 is by the year 2020, at 15% or greater per year. We are going to have ROICs of 15% or greater per year. And we are going to pay out, in the form of dividend and or share buyback, 50% of our profits. We're going to do this with no new debt, because we're concerned about our credit rating. We're going to use organic funds to do this. And we're not going to do any major acquisitions, no M&A. We believe that we have the opportunity to find the customers with organic growth, which we find to be more valuable. So that was the plan that had been approved by the board of directors and on another series of high-priced consultants. So I listened to those numbers, and I told the CEO, plan's not going to work. You need to go back to your board and come up with a new plan. Now, if you're going to tell the CEO that he's wrong, you better be right. Was I right? Is this a flawed plan? 
I see some nodding heads. Why is this a flawed plan? Um, because you're assuming that the growth rate is the mean decimal rate times the automatic seed rate. That doesn't add Yeah, so the sustainable growth rate that we just defined <laughs> is the investment rate, which is what? 50%, because the payout's 50%, so therefore the reinvestment rate has to be 50%. So that is 50% times the ROIC, which is the formula I just gave you, which says this company can actually grow at 7.5% a year. This is the flaw. <clears throat> they can't grow at 50. Not with the resources that they have. So one of the ways they could do this, they could grow, is they could grow by saying, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an acquisition. But they said they weren't going to do any acquisitions. Or they could go borrow more money. But they said they weren't going to borrow any more money. So that's, that's the inherent problem with their plan. The number's not going to add up. Matter of fact, I was working with another company, an insurance company. I won't tell you who they are. But uh, I was sitting in the room, and in the room was their CEO and their CFO. And I was giving this exact slide, this exact example. And the CEO actually said, he said, basically, um, no, you're wrong. This doesn't work out because our company is growing and we're not borrowing any money. So there's a flaw in your formula. And anytime a CEO says there's a flaw in your formula, you're like, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? And I was like, okay, well, why do you think that there's a flaw in the formula? I was like, well, we're growing and we're not borrowing any money. So it was interesting that the CFO said, well, technically we're not borrowing any money, but we're creating special purpose entities and we're using the special purpose entities to do transfer pricing between the two entities to actually fund the growth of our business. So what's that sound like? Sounds like financing. So I guess that's the point, is that it actually does work out, right? So <clears throat> that's the key that I, I want you to start to understand about a business, is that fundamentally there's some things that will tell us a lot about a business, and one is what rate can it grow historically and systemically and in the future, and what kind of returns can it get it's kind of a sustainable growth rate. So that's one of the key concepts that we're going to talk about this semester. And G is going to come up again and again and again. Second concept is free cash flow. Free cash flow is defined as profit after reinvestment. All right? So profit after reinvestment equals free cash flow. Now, when we talk about value, the value of a business is not its future profits. Why not? And look at this slide. So here's a company that makes $100 million a year of profits. Can I give this $100 million a year of profits to my owners? I see some shaking of heads. I'm only repeating because this is for video purposes. Why not? Why can't I give the $100 million? Because I have to reinvest, in this case, 50 to sustain my business. So that's the point. 100 minus 50 is what I can actually give to my investors. That is what's called free cash flow. So the value of the business is actually based on the free cash flows. It's not based on the future profits. And so free cash flow is the theoretical payout rate of a business. Right? So <clears throat> that's why it's the value. It just so happens that this business is actually paying out all of its free cash flow. Now, what happens <clears throat> if a business generates free cash flow but doesn't pay it out? What happens to the cash? So if you don't reinvest and you retain it, where's the cash actually show up? Where in the balance sheet? Shows up as cash. You'll just see your cash balances go up. So I want you to think about a company like Apple Computer that has something like $170 billion or $180 billion worth of cash that they just announced in their balance sheet. That is what a lot of that cash is what we're going to call excess cash. So the theory that we're going to make is just like we define operating and non-operating assets, we're going to put cash into those two buckets. We're going to have something called operating cash and excess cash. And so what happens is free cash flow that doesn't get paid out is going to be called excess cash. It's literally cash that you can pay out anytime you want. You're just, for whatever reason, choosing not to pay it out. It's purely discretionary cash. Versus operating cash, which is cash that you actually need to run your business day to day that you can never pay out. Right? So <clears throat> that's the thing. Here's another flaw in a lot of people's thinking. They'll define net debt. And net debt is debt minus cash. But if you think about it, 
There is no business that can pay 100% of its cash to its bondholders. Could never happen. Because even if you went bankrupt, first of all, the lawyers would take a big hunk of that cash and the judge would give them the cash before the bondholders saw dime number one. All right, so it's unrealistic to use net debt as the actual amount of cash that a company can distribute. And that's why we're going to have to start to differentiate what can really be distributed. So really, net debt should be debt minus excess cash. So before you go running to all your other professors and say you're wrong, which as an undergrad will put you in a very bad position, <clears throat> what I want you to realize is people sometimes take shortcuts. And coming out of this class, what you're going to realize is net debt is a shortcut. Right? Because they're basically saying debt minus cash. But if you're doing this professionally, you want to distinguish between operating cash and excess cash that can actually be paid out. And I'll go back to an insurance company. So I got this question from another financial person in an insurance company, which is, we have cash. That's literally cash sitting in government interest risk-free investments. Is it excess or is it operating? Because the regulators require us to put the cash in these accounts to pay out future claims. So is that operating cash or excess cash? So I'm valuing an insurance company. I'm trying to figure my payout. What is the, what can I actually distribute to my investors? Regulatory cash reserves against future claims. Operating or excess? Operating. operating. So that's the point. If I use net debt, I'm going to get a flawed value because the regulators are never going to let them pay it out because they're going to want some cushion against future claims that need to be paid out. So cash is not just cash, and we're going to have to differentiate between the two. So if the regulators go back to an insurance company and say, you need more cash on hand as reserves, then all things being equal, the insurance company is going to be worth less because they're going to have less cash that they can distribute to their owners down the road. In fact, the opposite is true. If insurance companies or banks actually have less regulatory requirements, then the banks will actually have more cash freed up to reinvest in or pay out in their businesses. So <clears throat> if you think about things like Solvency II in Europe or Basel III that's happening in the U.S. in the banking system, it's all about tying up capital. And if you tie up more capital, banks are inherently going to be worth less because they have less cash that they can distribute to their owners. And that's actually becoming a problem for banks when you do bank valuation. Now, this is not a class about financial services, and I'm not going to go down the road too far with this. But this is what I mean by starting to understand the implications of some of the data that we're talking about here. So from a valuation standpoint, the other thing I want you to understand is that operating cash can't be zero. So I work with a lot of hospitals. And right now, hospitals are like universities. They're in a lot of trouble because states are cutting back on their funding of their hospitals. And the government's cutting back on its funding of hospitals. And most not-for-profit hospitals were making 2%. And they had no cash to begin with. And under the Affordable Care Act, they're actually lowering reimbursements. So they're going from 2% to break even or losing money. Yet they're getting no financial support and they're being told, figure it out. And that's one of the problems that hospitals are having. And so one of the challenges they're having is days cash on hand. And believe it or not, zero is not bankruptcy for a hospital. It's somewhere between 22 and 30 days that a hospital is going to have to go bankrupt because it won't have enough cash to actually survive on a daily basis. And that's the point. There's a level of minimal operating cash that a hospital actually has. Look at the bond rating agencies, and you'll actually see that when Moody's rates a hospital's bonds, it looks at days cash on hand. And what they'll do is they'll put the junk bond status not at zero, but they'll look when it gets closer to below 30, because that's when they know that hospitals are going to have problems. Matter of fact, General Motors. General Motors went bankrupt a few years ago with $10 billion worth of cash, because they basically said, less than $10 billion, we cease to operate. Now, a lot of people probably looked at that article, and they're like, that doesn't make any sense. $10 billion is a lot of cash. But when you're a $160 billion company around the world, that cash gets spread in all different subsidiaries all over the place, and you start to have trouble functioning and moving cash around to run your business. So I'm saying those are some of the nuances that we're going to start to get into this semester, which is really based on what is free cash flow and what is investment. But conceptually, profit minus reinvestment equals free cash flow. Future free cash flows equals the theoretical value of the business long term. Does this make sense? All right. Let's go forward. Next week, <clears throat> this is what you're going to hate me with, because what I'm also going to teach you is how to cash to calculate free cash flow formally, right? Because accountants don't do that. Under GAAP, free cash flow is not GAAP. So we have to manually calculate free cash flow. 
and people take shortcuts when they calculate free cash flow, just like they take shortcuts when they calculate ROIC, just like they take shortcuts when they calculate net debt. So I'm going to teach you formally how to calculate free cash flow next week and rearrange statements into those statements. And basically, it's going to involve two things. One, cash flow from operations, or what we're going to call gross cash flow, which is the cash coming from the income statement, minus reinvested cash in the balance sheet, in the invested capital. And that gets us <coughs> free cash flow. Excuse me, free cash flow. The reason why we do that is that the operations of a business are the sum of its future cash flows discounted to a present value. So that's what we're then going to do. We're going to discount the cash flows to value the firms. <coughs> now, this is a very important slide this semester, as definitionally and conceptually, because this slide <coughs> represents a very core concept. So <coughs> take this hypothetical company A that we've been talking about, and I'm going to add a hypothetical company B. B is a peer of A. Okay? So let's just say they're both in the same business selling similar products. <coughs> So here's the idea. A and B have identical starting profits of 100 million of no PAT or no PLAT, 100 million of after tax profit. They're both growing at 5% a year and expected to continue into the future. They have identical cost of capital, 10%. Okay? So same profits, same growth, same risk. Well, these two businesses have the same value. If you were buying the businesses, would you pay the same for both businesses? Which one would you pay more for? And why? Who's more valuable, A or B? B. Why is B more valuable? Because they have higher free cash flows. And we said the value is based on the free cash flows, not based on the profits. Everybody see that? Here's the logic I want you to follow with very closely. The reason B has more free cash flow than A is because B doesn't invest as much to generate the same profits. Everybody see that? The reason <coughs> B doesn't invest as much to generate the same profits is because B has a higher return on their investment, higher ROIC. They make 20%, they make 10%. B is better at what it does, therefore doesn't have to spend as much to make the same profits. This is the most direct way that I've ever been able to show a student that there's a direct relationship between ROIC and free cash flow. And what you need to understand about the approach I'm teaching you this semester is McKinsey, through the book, is an ROIC-based firm because they know that ROIC and free cash flow are the same thing. And ROIC is a easier to forecast number than forecasting free cash flow. And it just conceptually allows you to talk more about the business in a way that the business is going to understand. Because you walk into any company, you ask them what their free cash flows are, they have no idea. You walk in and you ask them what their ROIC is or return on investment, they have a pretty good idea. They're the same thing. And that's the point. This is what you can see very clearly. Here's an example or I have a higher ROIC, I don't have to spend as much to generate the same profits, I generate more cash flow. Now, what if I had invested the same? What if business B had invested 50 instead of 25? What would happen? Yeah. They'd have more growth, therefore more profits, and more free cash flow. In either case, they will have more free cash flow. So that's the key. At the same level of growth, a higher ROIC equates to more free cash flow. Now, what makes it tricky is that growths are not always the same across companies. So what we're going to have to adapt to is what's the difference in growth and ROIC and what does it mean to value. But I'm telling you, at the same level of growth, higher ROIC equals more free cash flow. And that will always work out. And so that's the general idea that you need to have conceptually. So the challenge is going to be if I have a company that's growing faster with a lower ROIC and higher ROIC but not growing as fast, how do I compare those two companies? That's where we're going to do some math to actually try and figure that out. But otherwise, conceptually, ROIC proxy for free cash flow. That's what you need to th start thinking about. So 
That's why we're going to use ROIC a lot this semester. Now, continuing on, when we value a company, the difference between valuing a project where we use NPV and a company where we also use NPV <clears throat> is that we assume that projects end and companies last forever. Well, predicting the cash flow of a company forever is difficult. So <clears throat> that's something, though, we still have to do. So, for example, in early March, I'll be working with Google, and I'm going to tell this really bad joke, <clears throat> which is, what's your revenue going to be in the year 2050? And a bunch of people from Google will laugh and say, we don't know. That's my attempt at humor as a finance person. So <clears throat> here's the point. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what their revenue is going to be in 20 or 30 years. You might as well be throwing darts at a board. So what do we do in finance? We proxy it out. So <clears throat> we'll generally forecast your cash flows for about 5 or 10 years. And then we'll realize that we're making the numbers up. And then what we'll do is we'll use this formula at the bottom of the page, which is called a growing perpetuity. Cash flow divided by R minus G. And we'll call it the continuing value period. So first five to ten years, defined period. Year six through infinity, continuing value. And it's just a, just a growing, per, growing perpetuity. What's your cash flow? What's your R, your discount rate? And what's your very long-term growth rate? R and G. We just define what G is, sustainable growth rate. So free cash flow, R and G. Those are the three things that we define. Now, what's interesting is that formula, if we go out five years, will represent between 60 and 80% of most companies' value. So there's two problems with this formula. Number one is very oversimplifying a business to three numbers. Right? It's just what we do in finance, but it is the way that we value companies. But there's actually a more inherent problem that McKinsey has identified. <clears throat> and the more inherent problem is that formula assumes that the IRR on future cash flows equals the IRR on historical cash flows. Translation, whatever return you're making now, you make forever. So I'm valuing BP, and oil has just gone from $100 a barrel to $50 a barrel. And therefore, BP's returns are terrible. And then I apply this to BP. Guess what happens? What's going to happen? Not only is the value going to be cut in half, what's the other problem with my valuation? Inherently, the value of BP is going to be based on $50 barrel oil forever. I'm going to undervalue BP because if I do believe that the oil eventually goes up, this formula is not going to represent that. It's going to exaggerate the, the downturn. Matter of fact, if I value Twitter, which is a rapidly growing, fast expanding company, what's the problem with this formula? can't grow like that forever, but this formula is going to assume it's going to grow like that forever. So that's the problem. The formula that we use, that we teach you, that is used on Wall Street, exaggerates the directionality of a company's performance. It's a limitation we have chosen to live with, but it is a limitation nonetheless of the formula that we use. And that's often why you can profit on this. That's what Warren Buffett starts to realize in the long run. No matter how good a company is that's doing today, like Apple, they're not going to grow at the same rate. Just law of large numbers. Can't happen. Yet when we value Apple, they'll be like, oh, this is how Apple's going to be the first trillion dollar company. Right? And then the same thing. We got this great company that's doing very poorly. Oh, they'll never do poor, they'll never do well again. That's why the stock price sucks. When the reality is they're probably going to do better in a couple of years, and we're going to undervalue them by using this formula. So this is what McKinsey has actually done. They call it the key value driver framework. It's core to the work they do, it's core to the book that you have assigned. But what they do is they rearrange this equation and they make two simple substitutions to rearrange it. Number one, cash flow is free cash flow, which is profit after reinvestment. Profit times one minus the investment rate. Sustainable growth is investment rate times ROIC. Therefore, investment rate is growth over ROIC. So the formula on the right-hand side of the page is a growing perpetuity. But notice what's different about that growing perpetuity versus the original. First, language. In the first formula, I have to ask you what your free cash flows are, which most people have no idea, and the accounts don't track. In the second formula, I ask you what your profits are, which everybody knows, and I ask you what your returns are, which you have a general idea of. So it's easier to use language, even though they're telling me the same thing. Second, that ROIC is incremental ROIC. So I can now explicitly forecast a different ROIC 
for the future of the business, which could be different than the historical ROIC. Right? Now, again, it's still simplified, and that's one ROIC for the entire future of the business. However, at least it can be more representative of the future than the past. Now, if the past and the future are the same, I didn't really get a real advantage from using this equation. Right? But if the past and the future are going to be different, then this equation can actually be very powerful. So this is what they call key value drivers, and this is what we're going to use this semester when we actually value firms. So let's put this into practice. I had asked you which company, A or B, was more valuable, and intuitively you said B. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the key value driver equation to quantify it. So I'm going to jump here to Excel, add another worksheet, make it big enough that hopefully you can see. Company A, Company B. Four parts to this equation. Profit, <coughs> growth, return, risk. So when we say profit, we mean no pat or no plat. When we say growth, we mean G. When we say return, we're saying ROIC. And when we say risk, we're using a cost of capital. We're using a WAC. <clears throat> and that will get us the value of the firm. Operating value. Okay? We're not doing non-operating value today. So <clears throat> both companies, pulling off of this slide, start out with $100 million a year of profit. Both companies are growing at 5% rates long term. Company A, 10% ROIC. B, 20% ROIC. Both companies had 10% cost of capital. Value equals profit times 1 minus growth divided by ROIC divided by WAC minus growth. Okay, let's put it in the formula. This company is worth a billion dollars. This company is worth 1.5 billion dollars. They're worth 50% more. You intuitively told me B was worth more. I'm just quantifying it with the data. Right? Now, there's something called a multiple. Think price to earnings multiple. Multiple of earnings. What multiple of earnings does company A trade at? What's their multiple? I'm sorry? 10 times. How'd you get 10? It's the price, which is the value, divided by the earnings, which is the profit. And again, I'm just repeating this for the video. They would trade at a multiple of 10. They would trade at a multiple of 15. ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow at the same growth rate. Multiples are a proxy for free cash flow valuations. <coughs> multiples are easy. Free cash flow valuations are hard. Banks like multiples. The other reason banks like multiples is because multiples are accessible in the real world. I can look at actual prices, where DCFs are based on theoretical values. But they have to give you the same answer. Right? And that's one of the things we're going to focus on this semester, is that we're going to show that multiple valuation methods can be used but every one of them have to give you the same answer no matter which approach you do. Because just because you change your method doesn't mean the value of the company changes. You're just rearranging equations. All right? So if we rearrange the equations, we still have to come up with the same answer using different approaches. So that's the point. The multiple method of valuation has to equal the DCF valuation method. And what I'm going to start to show you is what drives multiples. Because what you've previously learned and what is often used in the real world is a naive view of multiples. Because what we'll do is we'll take the multiples, we'll average them out and say, oh, well, that's what this company is going to actually trade at. But that's naive because there are things that determine what a company's multiple will be based on. And so what I want you to understand is how to create a multiple and how to understand why a multiple is going to change and why it's different than its peers. And it actually comes right back to the key value driver equation. So I'll start with this. Why is B trading in a multiple of 15 versus 10? Why is B more valuable? What's different? Higher ROIC. 
That's the only difference. So ROIC must be one of the drivers of multiples in addition to a driver of value. So that's the point. Why do I pay 10 times earnings versus 15 times earnings? Obviously, the company with 15 times earnings is more valuable. Why? It's going to generate more free cash flow. Why? Because it's getting a better return in its investment. That's the direct link that we should start to have. So let's th see how these numbers change over time. It's a little simulation here. What happens if I double my profit <clears throat> for business A? So overnight, I make twice as much money as I originally thought. What happens to the value of the business? What happens to the multiple of the business when I double my profits? What's going to double? You can look at that screen, too. All right, and the multiple? Okay, so here's 200, here's 300, here's 400. Let's look at business B. Here's 200, here's 300, here's 400. So, <clears throat> key lesson, you're absolutely right. Is it the value or not? Why did the value go up? Because the company made absolutely more cash flow, therefore more MPV. But what I'm paying for the cash flow doesn't change. So obviously, more profits do not equal a different multiple. So <clears throat> profits don't affect the multiple. So what's going to affect the multiple? That's these three things. And that's what we call the key value drivers. Growth, spread. That's what I started with last week. Growth, return, risk. That's what's going to determine how much I pay for the profits. All right. So here's the thing. If nothing changes about the business and they make more earnings per share, then I can value the business by saying take the more earnings per share times the same PE and that's the value for the business. But if something's fundamentally changing about its future growth or return or risk, then there's going to be more dynamics at work. And that's the nuance that I want you to start to have. Because what you were taught was the original simplistic Grow your earnings at same P.E. equals new price. But the same P.E. assumes that those key value drivers are not changing. And if those drivers change, what I ch actually pay for the business changes because the free cash flows will change over time. So let's look at how changes in those drivers affect value, affect multiples. Let's start out with scenario number one. What if business A grows faster sustainably? They're a U.S. company that gets into fast-growing Asian markets. And so, therefore, we believe that they're going to get the same or better margins and grow faster long-term. So what's going to happen to the value of this business and what's going to happen to its multiple when it sustainably grows faster? Everything else being the same. What's going to increase? Uh, the value will increase and the multiple. All right, let's see how much the valuable and multiple increases when they start growing at 6% versus 5%. Right? How about 7% long-term growth? How about 8%? How about 9%? Start again. 6, 6%, 6%, 7%, 7%, 8%, 8%, 9%, 9%. What's going on here? <coughs> yeah. Company A has zero spread, company B has a positive spread. That's right. It's the growth spread combination. Company A has zero spread. I basically have a cost capital of 10%. I'm borrowing at 10. I make 10. I create no value. My IRR equals my R, which means I'm zero NPV. I get my money back. I have created nor destroyed no value. That's what's at work here. I like to call this the treadmill. You run really fast, you don't go anywhere. Eventually you get tired, you fall off. Right? That's the problem the companies run into. Is they're growing really fast, their share price isn't going anywhere, and they can't figure it out. And the answer is because they're growing at a zero spread. What's the difference with company B?
positive spread. It's exponential. This is the gasoline on the fire that I was talking about last Wednesday. If you grow a good return, you're borrowing a 10, you make 20, and you do more of it, you exponentially create value, so that gives you a high P.E. multiple. So next time you see a company with a ridiculous P.E. in the marketplace, what is it? It represents a high growth return expectation. High growth, high spread. That's a high P.E. <clears throat> now, scenario number three. What if I'm Coca-Cola and I announce to the world that, you know what, people have realized that sugar is not as good for them as we thought and people are buying less of my sugary drinks because they've associated my drink with being unhealthy. So we're having a growth problem around the world and we're going to narrow our long-term growth expectation from 5% to 4%. And oh, by the way, we're going to do a billion dollars worth of cost cuttings. This was the headline from Coke a few months ago. And then we're going to cut a billion dollars worth of cost to maintain our profits and our returns. So we're not going to sacrifice profits and returns as we grow lower. But we're also not going to spend as much money. So therefore, we're going to have the same returns at lower growth. What happens to Coke's stock price and P.E.? Value and P.E.? Returns stay the same, but grow up 4% versus 5%. What should happen? Yep. This is the expectation game. This is the cornerstone on expectations. I value a company based on expecting them to get a certain amount of growth at a certain amount of return. I realize I was wrong. I have to change my expectations. I lower them. I realize they're not worth as much. Share price goes down. Scenario number four. I have a negative spread. I'm Molson Coors. <clears throat> I'm borrowing a 10. I'm making eight. Do I want to grow this business? What happens when I grow? 6%, 7%. The more I grow, the less valuable I become. I destroy value at an increasing rate. So what do I do? How do I increase value? Five, assuming I have negative spread. Three, one, negative two. Negative four. <clears throat> this is IBM. This is what Romedy, CEO of IBM, has been doing. Because she inherited a business that was hardware and services. And what she's realizing is the margins on hardware are going to nothing. Because they've become so commoditized. Initially, IBM said it was the PC market that was commoditized, and we're just going to do servers. Now the server market has become so commoditized that they're literally just trying to ditch their hardware business and focus on services. So if you look at IBM, what's been happening, IBM has had six consecutive declines in revenue and earnings. Primarily revenue is going down. And what they're doing is they're ditching their hardware businesses. They're trying to sell it off. right? But what is she doing? She's focusing on the slower growing, right, as IBM is in total, but focusing on the service business, getting rid of the hardware. So IBM is not going to grow as much, but it's going to get better returns long term. So those earnings themselves will become more valuable. That is the entire business plan that she's implementing at IBM. It's based right here on this formula. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the thing. Does this make sense to everybody? Those are the four scenarios of the key value drivers that you should always keep in mind growth, and return. Now, obviously, other things could change. So, for example, if I fundamentally believed that the risk of a business was going to be lower going forward, what should happen to the value of company A? If I believe interest rates are going to rise, and therefore, according to CAPM, costs of equities are going to rise, what should happen to the value of business A? As I said, this formula can help you by understanding the key value drivers and what they're telling you can actually help you understand a lot about what's happening to businesses. Matter of fact, <clears throat> this is why I want you to play stock track, and this is why I want you to pay attention to headlines, is because what you should start, if you actually start looking at the headlines on a pretty regular basis, keep the key value driver formula in mind. Because there's three things that will tell you about the direction of a company's price. Number one, growth. 
Number two, return. Number three, risk. Read the headline, read the article, think about those three things. You can start becoming predictive of what's going to happen in their stock price. So that's the point. It's an adjustment of those three things that are going to adjust the expectation of those that's going to adjust the price. And so that's really what Stock Track is about. It's applying this theory to practice. Now, I'll put a big disclaimer that I'm not asking you to go out and trade real money yet until you become professionals and can actually do this. Your students, I don't want a student to lose all their tuition money and not be able to graduate because you can't pay your bills. All right, because this is still dangerous when you deal with expectations. But in Stock Track, where we're not playing with real money, you're starting to think about the headlines you're reading of companies, start understanding the adjustment in these expectations and these variables is really what's going to start adjusting in their prices. Yeah. So the idea of negative growth <coughs> just says that, let's go back to two, the two scenarios I showed you. Here's a company that has negative growth that becomes more valuable. And the reason why is because if I'm borrowing a 10 and making 8, I want to do less of it. Here's a company that has negative growth, and they become less valuable. Because I'm borrowing a 10, I'm making 20, and I do less of it. So negative growth is the accelerant to what the direction of the spread is. So the opposite is true. If I have a terrible spread, that's growth that's going to be value destructive, so I'm wasting my time investing in that growth. If I have positive growth, I want to invest in that because that's going to be exponential. And so what I really want to find, and that's why sustainability and competitive advantage becomes important, what companies can grow and get good returns in their marketplace? They're the ones that are going to be the real value creators versus what companies are just going to grow to grow? Because just being bigger doesn't necessarily make you better, right? So that starts to play out in the real world, right? In the businesses that we run. Other questions? Here's an example I gave to the other class, by the way. I forgot to give it to you earlier, but just to be consistent. When I was doing the sustainable growth rate, I was giving them the story of Tesla. And <clears throat> basically, I was teaching out at Wharton West, <clears throat> which Wharton actually has a camp campus in downtown San Francisco. And we're doing an exec ed class back in September for a bunch of Chinese CEOs and C-level execs. And they were being hosted because they wanted to see how VCs in Silicon Valley invest in tech companies so they could do the same in China. And they wanted to do a site visit. So the company they wanted to visit was Tesla. And it was really cool because I got to go. It's got a big bus. We drove down from San Francisco to Tesla. And interesting, if anybody's been to Tesla, they're like rock stars. Like, everybody does the pilgrimage. They want to go work and see Tesla. And as a matter of fact, one of the things right in front of their headquarters, they, have, they actually have valet parking. So you can literally valet park your car to go do a site visit. But they've had so many companies visit them, they now charge $50,000 a site visit just to keep people away. And people are still paying it because they want to go see what Tesla is all about. So <clears throat> we got lucky, and we didn't have to pay the $50,000 because one of the Chinese CEOs was a billionaire, and he – wanted to buy 200 Teslas. So they let us in for free because <clears throat> his goal was to open up a Tesla rental company in Beijing and Shanghai. So they decided it was worth to let us in without paying the $50,000. And it's like he was a billionaire. So it's not like he was not going to actually write the check. But in any event, <clears throat> so we're sitting there and we're listening to Tesla talking about their business. And it wasn't Elon Musk, but it was some senior leaders. <clears throat> and it actually had to do with their growth, which goes right back to the key value drivers. <clears throat> and one of the questions that got asked is, has anybody seen one of the Tesla cars, the more recent ones? Is it nice? Yeah, beautiful. Is it expensive? Uh, depends on the model. What do they start at? They start at around 65. Yeah, but usually they're in the 90 to to $100,000 range because nobody's going to get a stripped-down model. So, so that's the point. You're going to spend at least $90,000 for this car. Now, in three years, in 2017, they're going to come up with a $35,000 Tesla. That's their goal. That's their stated goal publicly. Right? And actually, this year, they're coming out with the SUV Tesla. In fact, we had to sign NDAs to go into their headquarters. And right behind the front desk, when you go through the doors, they had all of their prototypes out there. And they had the two prototype SUVs. Because I didn't know this, but they almost went bankrupt a couple of years ago. 
and Mercedes actually made an investment to save them. So they have a partnership with Mercedes. And so the SUV is based on the Mercedes design. And they had two of them. One was the boxy, expensive Mercedes that they make in Europe. And the other is the more rounded, cheaper one they make in Alabama. And they had literally had two of those that looked just like those. They were both had Tesla engines. And they were just trying to figure out which one they were going to launch as their SUV this year. So they're now seeing some spy photos that are showing up as they're test driving it outside of their main campus. But nonetheless, it's going to come out soon. It'll be one of those two cars, which is going to be the SUV they launched this year. But that's just incidental to the story. This is the key point of the story. Which car do you think they think they make a better ROIC on? The $90,000 car or the $35,000 car? If you're starting out, Tesla today, do you think they'd make any money if they sold a $35,000 car? With all the money they're spending on R&D and initial product development? So, are you better off with a lower ROIC or a higher ROIC as a startup? What does a higher ROIC allow you to do? to grow quickly with less capital. So that's what I said. Elon Musk is the smarter guy than a lot of people give him credit for. Because, number one, from a marketing standpoint, if I start with a high price point and go lower, that's better for a market image than starting with a low price point and then trying to convince people to pay more money for the car. Right? But number two, if I go with a high price point, I need less VC. <laughs> because if I go with a lower price point, I need a lot more VC to produce money losing cars than if I go with a high end model. It actually goes right back to our, our valuation. But here's the point. If I can prove that I can sell those cars at scale, make money on my $90,000 car, make money on whatever more than $35,000 that SUV costs, and then scale and finally make money on that $35,000 car, then when I get to my valuation, my growth is going to be far more valuable. And that's why Tesla is so valuable in the market today, because people are saying, look, they're making 70% gross margins on their cars. They just spend too much on initial development costs. But when they can amortize it against volume, they can actually make some real money. So Tesla's valuation is all based on the volume they could make, because the market believes in the ROIC of a $90,000 car. What they don't believe is whether they're not going to buy enough cars to do that. Now, they, they believe there's enough, because Tesla today is worth market cap $27 billion. But here's the thing. What's going to be very important to Tesla on an annualized basis is whether or not they can achieve going from $3.7 billion of sales last year to almost $12 billion in the next three years. So it's about the growth. See, they've already proven to the market that they think, and you can see this in the earnings forecast, that they're going to make an operating profit of $1.3 billion on almost $11.6 billion worth of sales. The market believes that. The question is, can they excuse me, hit that growth target? So right now, what you'll see, the movement in Tesla stock price is all about how many vehicles are being sold and what is people's appetite for buying electric vehicles and what's the competition look like. So to some degree, when the BMW was at the new i3 came out, like will people want to buy the i3, not the Tesla? So yes, growing the pie, but is it taking enough share of the pie? Now, frankly, when I looked at the specs, I think the i3 goes like 80 miles and the Teslas go about three to 400 miles. Like I, I don't know who would want to buy the BMW i3 because I mean, I couldn't drive it from where I live to campus and back with 80 miles. I, I, I wouldn't make it. So it's not, I can't be their target market because I can't even drive to work. Not in D.C., especially if you're stuck in traffic. And again, the, the gallons, like two gallons of gas in the tank is what they give you as an alternative. But then you're going to the gas station every like 30 minutes. So <clears throat> I don't really know what BMW is really targeting for the i3 market in terms of real growth. Where Tesla, like I said, those vehicles go three to 400 miles. Like that's a practical car you could actually use every day. If I lived in San Francisco, I could go to Sacramento in that car and back and actually make it. I couldn't do that with the BMW i3. That's their competitive advantage with their battery technology that they've actually implemented with their engines. So again, that's what the market's starting to believe. I'm going a little far afield in my initial example, but this is what I'm telling you. Understanding the value of the company is about understanding these four things. 
How much absolute cash do they generate? That's going to tell you the DCF value, but the multiple is going to be based on the key value drivers, the growth, the return, the risk, the growth, the spread, and then how sustainable and how does that change over time. If you have those conversations with each other in the next few weeks, you'll be surprised at how much you can explain what really happens in the real world. That's what we're going to focus on. Now, we're going to get into the granular detail of this because we're going to granularly forecast free cash flows, but eventually this is what you need to understand this semester. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Crippling fears? All right, here's some insight into your exercise for Wednesday. So one of the things <coughs> that you can do with this formula is I can do something called, this gets me <coughs> <coughs> something called an enterprise value multiple. But what I also will see in the real world is something called a PE multiple, price to earnings multiple. Well, price to earnings is different than enterprise value because the enterprise value is the value of the debt and equity. The price in the PE is just the market cap. Okay, So it's based on the earnings, which instead of no PAT is based on net income. And the growth, instead of the growth in the free cash flow, is the growth in net income. And the return on invested capital becomes the return to shareholders, the return on equity, because net income is the profits to the shareholders, not the debt and the equity. And the WAC, since I have a return on equity, I'm looking at spread, becomes cost of equity. So what I'm telling you is you can use the exact same key value drivers formula, substituting those four numbers and get an actual price to earnings multiple. Because price to earnings is based on equity, earnings per share. Whereas market multiples, enterprise value multiples, are based on enterprise value, which is the value of the debt and equity, which the no plat is the profit to the debt and the equity, and the WAC is the return in the debt and the or sorry, the, the risk of the debt and equity, and the ROIC is the return in the debt and equity. So you can splice the same formula two different ways, just depending on what you're putting into the ingredients. Right? So here's the thing. I was talking about IBM in the first class, and I had no idea how it was going to go. <clears throat> But that's the beauty of this class, is we're going to pick real-world companies, and we're going to try and explain things, as I used to say back in the day when I lived in South Carolina. We explain things, explain things. So here's the thing, IBM. Let's try and explain IBM stock price using this formula. <clears throat> now, what I want you to understand is there's four things, and I go to the IBM U.S. equity, and I start out in the EEO screen, which is the earnings estimate overview, and I'll need annualized data. What's going to be more important to the market is forward earnings, not historical earnings. And therefore, what the book is going to talk about is second year forward earnings matter. In IBM's case, <coughs> that would be 2016. That would be considered the second forward year. Okay, that's when things get more normalized. That's what the pros are going to start looking out at. So here is the earnings estimate for IBM, and it's going to be net income adjusted. And the analysts will use adjusted net income rather than gap net income because adjusted net income takes out one-time accounting gains and losses, non-cash items. So therefore, it's a more realistic cash earnings number, at least theoretically. So adjusted net income is more important than gap net income. So for IBM, 15,727. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to back into the growth because we actually have a data point for IBM's actual PE today. Their actual PE today, based on today's stock price of 156 and change, is based on adjusted earnings in 2016 is 9.26. So actual... 9.26. So I'm going to want my model PE to be very close to that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> return on equity for IBM, right, scroll down here. Here's the next three years on an annualized basis. 71, 62, 74. Now, one of the things that IBM has been doing for the last decade 
is they buy a ton of stock back every year. And it's just reducing their equity. Right? So basically, they are getting tremendous returns in equity because, like I said, they're not worried about growth. They're all about shareholder value. And one way to distribute shareholder value is to get rid of the equity so my earnings per share look like they're growing. And I'm getting better returns in equity. So next three years, <coughs> 71, 62, 74, I'm going to say the three-year average somewhere around 68%. There's IBM's return in equity in a go-forward basis. Now, cost of equity, I can get on the WAC screen, WACC, real-time estimate of the cost of capital. Bloomberg gives me a WAC of 6.4%, but that's the cost of the debt and the cost of the equity. In this case, I want the cost of the equity, all right, which is based on CAPM. There's a real-time CAPM for IBM. There's the risk-free rate, 1.93, which is the current yield in the 10-year treasury in the U.S., there's the country premium for the U.S., which is the beta times the market return. So again, you can change these values if you disagree with them, but nonetheless, Bloomberg is doing a real-time cap out. Now, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to actually use the Bloomberg number versus what the academics often do, which is use a long-term number, right? Bloomberg does it differently. And this, by the way, is the hang-up in McKinsey's book for the sixth edition that they've been working on recently, is because... They're trying to sync with the real world on CAPM, and they're having challenges. Because what the academics say is there's a long-term risk premium. It's usually between 5 and 7%, depending on your time horizon. Well, right now, to explain current prices in the S&P 500, it's 9.59%. Because what Bloomberg does is it knows what the earnings estimates are, and it knows the value of the S&P 500. So what it can do is it can figure out what the discount rate is that actually makes the valuation work. And then it could subtract the risk-free rate to get into an equity risk premium on the marketplace. So Bloomberg actually backs into an equity risk premium on the market. The advantage of using the Bloomberg equity risk premiums is that it actually does help explain stock prices today. Right? But long-term, pros might actually do it differently because they might say, you know what? <clears throat> interest rates are not going to stay at 2% long-term. Inflation is eventually going to be higher. Interest rates are going to have to go up. And that has to actually cause my cap M to be different. Now, here's what's interesting. Let's take you far afield for a second. But it, let's just say the long-term risk premium is 5.5%, which is what McKinsey advocates to use as their global risk premium. <clears throat> right now, the country risk premium is 7.6%. It's about 200 basis points higher. If I add 200 basis points to the risk-free rate, then that's basically saying at a traditional risk premium, Interest rates are closer to 4% long-term, which is what they think the market should be really based at. So one could argue that right now what's happening in the U.S. is we have higher risk premiums. Another reason we could have higher risk premiums is people believe there's a government subsidy to interest rate that eventually is going to go away. And when it does, risk-free rates are going to spike. And so if you use historical risk premiums, somewhere around 35 to 4% is where the market's probably predicting today that interest rates are going to go to long-term. And so they're compensating for that by using a higher risk premium in the marketplace. Again, <clears throat> CAPM at play here. You can see some data. But for purposes of our exercise, we're just going to take the cost of equity, 7.6%. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Using my formulas, that would give IBM a PE of 13, and they'd be worth $200 billion at zero growth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back in to what expectation the growth rate should be given today's stock price. Because I know the result, and I know four of the inputs that give me the result. So what I want to do is I want to figure out what the market must be using for growth. Now, do you think the market's using a positive or a negative growth number? Why would it be using a negative growth number? All right, mainly because they have a giant spread. That should be your actual answer. And by the way, these questions I'm asking, I'm going along, those are going to be the questions on your midterm. So half your midterm exam is going to be, could you plug and play? What you're probably good at is finance and accounting majors. But the other half of the midterm is, can you think? Do you actually understand what you're calculating? And that's, to me, what's more important about this class. Because you've been made it to this class churning out formulas in other classes. Do you actually know what they tell you? Do they know what they need? Can you explain them? That's what I want you to focus on. So why is it a negative growth rate? Because they got a giant spread. That's the only way that explains this. So 
Let's try negative 2%, see what happens. Negative 3%, negative 4%, negative 3.5%, Negative three point three, sorry, negative sorry, three point seven, somewhere around there. <clears throat> that gets me very close to the forward PE. But that's the point. Intuitively, I already told you what is Romani doing? She's getting out of the hardware business, she's giving up a lot of revenue to grow the services business, which is more profitable. What the market's basically saying is okay. I'm going to expect lower growth, negative growth, as you shrink out of the hardware business. Services business isn't growing fast enough to replace what you're getting rid of hardware, but you're getting me into a more profitable high ROI business, and you're trying to get out of the low ROI business, and I think that that's a sustainable model that's profitable. Right? Now, the question is going to be, once she dumps the hardware, can the services keep growing at a profitable rate? That's going to be the long-term question, but people are still focused on the short-term question, which is what happens to IBM as it's transforming from a hardware to a services company. Even with negative growth, they're still valuable, but notice that PE multiple with a 68% ROE is not 20 or 30. Why? Because there's no growth to that high ROIC. She's just optimizing what she has. She's not growing what she has. Yes? Could you explain in a little bit more detail why? Uh, so you said growth, growth is negative because the spread is so large. That's right. So why? Well, what I'm saying is that's just the math. So what I'm saying is to explain this multiple, to get to a nine times earnings, I only explain it with this highest spread because this is saying I'm making a huge amount of free cash flow. I'm not paying much for those earnings. I'm only paying about 10 times for those earnings. Why am I not paying much for those earnings? Because I'm not expecting those earnings to grow. I'm actually expecting them to shrink. All right. Versus, and by the way, just to double check this, that says my value should be around 147 billion. And today, shares times share price of IBM is 155. So I'm kind of in the ballpark. But that's what I was want to tell you. Is like this formula can be used to explain the real world. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. Let's look at RV. And let's look at, on the RV screen, comp sheets. And the first comp sheet are the multiples. And one of the multiples, PEFY2, forward year 2, that's the normalized multiple we're looking at, for IBM, 9.26. This is their peers, their GIX peers. I'll do Bloomberg peers. So this is IBM against the rest of the tech company peers. Tech company peers are at 14. IBM's at 9.7. What's going on here? Why is Oracle at almost 15? Either higher growth or higher spread. I know it's one of those two things. Well, here's the thing I can do. I can actually go to Oracle. What's the ticker symbol? Oracle. Oracle. I can go to Oracle. I can go to their earnings estimates. And I can look at generally what the ROEs are expected to be, lower than IBM's. So quick inference, why is Oracle trading at a higher PE than IBM? More growth. Is that, that, is, that intuitively sounds right? Oracle selling databases. Databases are exploding in the world today. Oracle selling them. They're growing very fast. IBM isn't. I'm willing to pay a premium much higher to own Oracle than IBM because IBM is going to make more money out of existing earnings. Their growth as a company is not really going anywhere. Oracle still growing at a company, yes, at a slightly less spread, but high growth with slightly lower return is more valuable than high return with no growth. Actually, negative growth in IBM's case. Matter of fact, here's the last example that I did in the last class. What about PayPal? So basically, eBay is spinning out PayPal. And right now, there are bankers that are probably talking to eBay about what multiple we need to either sell PayPal for or if we IPO them, what they would actually trade at in the marketplace. So I look at Visa because basically PayPal is a, a payment processor. And I look at Visa's comps. So here's the interesting thing. If I use the Gix comp, then IBM is on this list, which for reasons I don't fathom, but that's okay. That's why Bloomberg has its own curated list. But the average multiple at the industry, which includes payroll processing, and uh, or pr which because paychecks is on there, credit card processing, and 
I don't even know why IBM's on that list other than their customers. But here's the point. Average industry, PE, 17 and a half. Visa, 22. IBM, 9. See, here's the problem. If I go to PayPal and I say, or eBay, and I say PayPal should have an average PE and they should go to market at 17.5. What does that assume? If I tell eBay they should have an average PE, what does that assume? What does it assume about growth? And what does it assume about ROIC? Therefore, spread. It assumes average growth and average spread. See, that's the naive approach to PE that you've been taught. Is if I use the same average PE as the industry, I'm assuming that PayPal is average. Is PayPal growing faster or slower than the average? That's going to influence the PE. Is PayPal's returns better or worse than the average? That's going to influence the PE. That's what's going to be more important when I determine and I go to my institutional clients and I try and convince them to pay more or less than this average PE, whether or not they're going to be willing to do it. So that's the other half of what the bankers have to figure out is what is that growth? What is the PE? What does it tell me? By the way, if I look at Visa and I just go in to their EEO and I look at the annualized EEO for Visa, <coughs> return on equity, 22, 25, 29. Think about IBM. IBM was in the 60s. Visa's in the 20s. Visa's trading at 20 times earnings. IBM's trading at 9 times earnings. Why are people paying so much for Visa? Growth. 99.x% percent of people in China today don't use credit cards. 99% of people in Africa don't use credit cards or debit cards. 99% of people in Latin America don't use credit or debit cards. That's why people are buying Visa. It's not about growth in the U.S. It's about growth in the rest of the world as we become a cashless society and we eventually move people away from cash into online payments of some type. Visa is going to get a piece of that market. Are they going to be as profitable as some of the professional service businesses that are doing consulting? They don't have to be because they have all this growth in front of them. That's why we're paying 20 times earnings for Visa. A little bit lower spread, but higher growth rate. And that's why they're trading in a premium in the market, because there's probably a higher growth rate at Visa that's expected than Oracle, right? even for similar levels of return on equity. That's the type of insight you need to have. That's what you're going to practice in the Bloomberg Lab on Wednesday. So come to class, ready to do your homework to assignment on Wednesday. This will be posted as a Google video on the website for reference.